commendation dedication and a personal foreword of prison life in andersonville this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by jeffrey smith new orleans louisiana prison life in andersonville by john levi miley commendation that the following narrative of southern prison life should be written so many years after the occurrence of the events described is explained by the fact that the author has been urged by many friends to put on record his descriptions that have interested many people in the east in the interior and in the west to members of the grand army of the republic of the women's relief corps allied organizations and readers generally i am glad to commend this book as giving a more particular account of the opening of providence spring than has before appeared appreciation of the strenuous days of the great civil war will be revived and the memories of veterans not a few will be refreshed by this interesting story h m triubel commander-in-chief of the grand army of the republic princeton illinois march second nineteen twelve dedication dedicated to the woman's relief corps whose tender thoughtful care has preserved the sacred memorials of the war and to the memory of my comrades in arms who have answered the final call to the age-worn remnant who still linger behind and to the younger patriots of the present generation to whom it is given in the happier days of peace to fight for their country the bloodless battles of righteousness and truth a personal forward the establishment and perpetuity of our union have been secured by the sacrifices of war the declaration of independence preceded seven weary years of conflict whose culminating sufferings were experienced in the british prison ships and in the winter camp at valley forge in this contest the patriotic soldiers of the north and of the south made common cause and what they did and what they suffered indicates a measure of the enduring worth of our national life the story of revolutionary days finds an enlarged counterpart in the sufferings of the civil war a phase of the great struggle is recalled in the following narrative of events which belongs to a rapidly receding past soon no survivor will be left to tell the tale hence the desirability of putting it into permanent form before it fades altogether from recollection to some the story of the breaking out of providence spring may seem to have been given undue prominence in this record but it is around that event that these reminiscences gather and the circumstances attending were so indelibly stamped upon the memory of the writer that they call for expression probably he was the youngest of the group of andersonville prisoners who participated in the concert of prayer that preceded the unsealing of the fountain and on that account he may be the only survivor in the course of the narrative unpleasant things have been referred to in the interests of truth but nothing has been set down in malice the great healer has closed up many wounds of hearts as well as of bodies and the grass has grown green over the graves of buried controversies the boys in gray and the boys in blue now fraternize around common campfires and under a common flag but while the writer has none save the kindliest feelings toward his brothers of the lost cause he cannot help rejoicing that alike in the clash of arms and in the more peaceful conflict of ideas which has followed 
the principles for which he and others bled and suffered have gained the victory and are among the things which never perish from the earth we are coming father abraham three hundred thousand more from mississippi's winding stream and from new england's shore we leave our plows and workshops our wives and children dear with hearts too full for utterance but with a silent tear we dare not look behind us but steadfastly before we are coming father abraham three hundred thousand more if you look across the hilltops that meet the northern sky long lines of moving dust your vision may descry and now the wind an instant tears the cloudy veil aside and floats aloft our spangled flag in glory and in pride and bayonets in the sunlight gleam and bands brave music pour we are coming father abraham three hundred thousand more if you look up all our valleys where growing harvests shine you may see our sturdy farmer boys fast forming into line and children from their mother's knees are pulling at the weeds and learning how to reap and sow against their country's needs a farewell group stands weeping at every cottage door we are coming father abraham three hundred thousand more end of commendation dedication and personal forward. Chapter One of Prison Life in Andersonville by John Levi Miley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Writer's Credentials. The writer of the following narrative feels justified in calling attention to his military record in order that he may be furnished with a warrant for inviting the attention of readers to the matters herein described broadly speaking his record is that he saw nearly four years of active service including ten months of confinement in confederate prisons and three months in hospitals and parole camps given more in detail it would be as follows he enlisted at the age of 17 on September 2nd, 1861, at Hastings in the 8th Regiment Michigan Volunteer Infantry, Company F, of which N. H. Walbridge was captain, Traverse Phillips, 1st Lieutenant, Jacob Mouse, 2nd Lieutenant, and John D. Sumner, Orderly Sergeant. The 8th was known as the famous Wandering Regiment of Michigan, ex-Governor Colonel William M. Fenton, commander. His regiment was mustered in at Grand Rapids and journeyed via Detroit, Cleveland, and Pittsburgh to Washington, going into camp on Meridian Hill overlooking the capital. On October 19th, with his regiment, he embarked from Annapolis on the steamship Vanderbilt, taking part in the DuPont expedition to the South Carolina coast and occupancy of Beaufort and the Sea Islands. He was in engagements on Coosa River and at the bombardment of Fort Pulaski off Savannah. While his regiment was in the campaign of James Island near Charleston, he was in the Signal Corps service on the Beaufort River. In April, the regiment sailed to Virginia. He was at the second bull run in July and with the Maryland campaign of South Mountain and Tetum. The succeeding Fredericksburg fighting and thence via Kentucky to Vicksburg and Jackson, Mississippi. In the autumn of 63, he marched via Cumberland Gap to East Tennessee and took part in conflicts at Blue Springs, Lenoir Station, Campbell Station, the Siege of Knoxville, and defense of Fort Saunders. After re-enlistment with his comrades in January, 
he marched over the mountains nearly two hundred miles in ten days through deep snow to the railroad at crab orchard kentucky this severe ordeal was followed by a brief respite of a thirty days furlough from cincinnati to michigan in april eighteen sixty four the regiment rejoined the ninth army corps at annapolis and on may third he was after examination in washington confirmed for a commission as lieutenant on the fourth he overtook his regiment camping near the rappahannock river on the evening of the fifth the vicinity of the rapidan river was reached in full view of the smoke of sedgwick's artillery opening the great battle of the wilderness on the afternoon of the sixth his regiment was ordered into action when he with a thousand others from the division was taken prisoner and marched to lee's headquarters where he saw the famous general whom he remembers as sitting with great dignity of bearing upon his horse calmly viewing the situation and it was reported that he kindly remarked to a group of prisoners that they must make the best of their predicament on the ninth the examination papers came for the new lieutenant but he was now the guest of the confederacy and could not be excused a comrade sent to his home the disquieting message missing in action and probably killed but happily from orange courthouse by the great kindness of a virginia lieutenant a telegram was forwarded by flag of truce to his parents stating that he still survived the memorial services announced for the following week were postponed and are yet to take place introductory experiences as a prisoner of war included many hours of fasting followed by a most exhaustive march of twenty-eight miles to orange courthouse under close cavalry guard thence by rail to gordonsville where the place of detention was a pen frequently used for the rounding up of cattle at this point the prisoners were usually relieved of any superfluous clothing and outfit fortunately the writer had discovered in the crowd five members of his regiment he and they drew together as companions in misfortune and formed a group in which each one was to have a share and share alike of all they possessed and they entered into a solemn pledge to care for one another in sickness very early in the morning of our night at gordonville we were aroused by the sharp command wake up there wake up there you yanks fall into two ranks quick there given by a confederate sergeant the occasion was the arrival of a trainload of beef cattle for the confederate army and the master of transportation saw an opportunity to load the prisoners into the freight cars just made vacant and which were to return to lynchburg immediately to be thus unceremoniously aroused from sleep and hustled into filthy cars made us very indignant but there is a divinity that shapes our ends rough hew them how we will and in the confusion of moving in the twilight and the absence of inspection we got off scot-free from the usual ceremony of being stripped of superabundant clothes and accoutrements thus our group of six were each left in possession of a blanket a section of shelter tent a haversack a tin cup and plate a knife a fork a spoon and such scanty clothing as we had on the extras we possessed were a frying pan a file and several pocket knives two or three towels a small mirror and a thin piece of mottled soap the latter was used exclusively for a sunday morning wash of hands and face until it melted away this unusual amount of equipment was kept as inconspicuous as possible and was safely carried through the prisons at lynchburg and danville where we awaited transportation to an unknown destination 
which proved to be the military inferno of andersonville in southwestern georgia to reach which we rode more than seven hundred miles from the battlefield packed fifty and sixty in a freight car with twenty or thirty of our number on the top the locomotives which burned pitch pine emitted clouds of acrid smoke that mingled with dust arising from the roadbed enveloped the train in a gloomy suffocating pall mile after mile the worn rattling freight cars and wheezing engine crept along the right-of-way which as a narrow lane threaded the interminable pitch pine forests that admitted no stirring breeze on sunday morning we arrived in the beautiful city of augusta georgia our train was sidetracked on a principal thoroughfare whose borders were embowered in luxuriant foliage which screened attractive homes whence the church bells were calling the summer dressed occupants on the sidewalk opposite from the train groups of the people loitered to gaze upon the grimy famished prisoners who swarmed upon the tops of the freight cars and formed a sweltering crowd within several ladies deferred their church going re-entered their houses emerged with baskets filled with sandwiches crossed the street to the side of the train and overcoming the objections of the guards handed out the precious food to the grateful men who responded with their most courteous thanks this little piece of genuine chivalry was the one bright spot in the torturing journey and was matched by the sensibilities of some southern ladies who later viewing the interior of andersonville from the stockade platform turned away their faces weeping end of chapter one chapter two of prison life in andersonville by john levi miley this librivox recording is in the public domain an inside view of a confederate prison at the time of our incarceration in andersonville the crisis of the war of the rebellion was reached general grant was fighting the great battles of the wilderness in virginia the investment of petersburg was about to begin and general lee was resisting the impact of the federal forces with unsurpassed skill and heroism general sherman was also hastening his preparations to penetrate the vitals of the confederacy by his famous march to the sea skirmishes by the contending forces were of daily occurrence and frequently battles were fought that now loom large in history to bury the dead was not difficult but the care of the wounded was a grave concern to both armies an affair of still greater magnitude was the gathering up of the captured officers and soldiers the transporting of them hundreds of miles and the placing of them in prisons for safe keeping the confederate authorities adopted a simple and logical plan foodstuffs for their armies could not be gathered in war-swept virginia nor to any great extent from the border states in georgia and alabama in parts of the carolinas mississippi and louisiana faithful slave labor produced an abundant supply of rice corn and bacon sweet potatoes and beans to transport these bulky materials to the armies of lee hood and johnson required every locomotive and freight car that could be mustered on southern railroads hence the northward bound trains were heavily laden those going southward were empty and were available to carry away the thousands of union prisoners 
at several points in the south atlantic and gulf states stockade prisons were set up notably that in southwestern georgia named after an adjacent hamlet andersonville this celebrated place of confinement for federal prisoners below the rank of commissioned officer was located about 62 miles from Macon. It consisted of a stockade made of pine logs 25 feet long, set upright in a trench 5 feet deep, enclosing some 16 acres, afterwards enlarged to 26 acres. This enclosure was oblong in form, with its longest dimension in a general north and south direction, and had two gates in its western side near the north and south ends, respectively. It was commanded by several stands of artillery, comprising sixteen guns, located at a distance on rising ground. From four directions the guns could sweep the prison interior with grape shot or shells. A line of poles was planted along the lengthwise center of the pen. We were informed that if the men gathered in unusual crowds between the range of the poles and the north and south gates, the cannon would open upon us. A report was circulated among us to the effect that General Sherman had started an expedition to release us, and we were informed that if his troops approached within seven miles of the stockade, the prisoners would be mowed down by grape shot. The fact is that one of his generals proposed a sortie that never was made. About July 20, 1864, General Stoneman was authorized at his own desire to march with cavalry on Macon and Andersonville in an effort to rescue the national prisoners of war in the military prisons there. Outside and against the stockade, platforms for guards were placed two or three rods apart and were so constructed that the sentinel climbed a ladder and stood waist high above the top of the wall and under a board roof which sheltered him from the sun and rain each of the guards faced the vast mass of prisoners and was ordered to closely watch the dead line before and below him halfway to his comrade on his right and left the dead line formed a complete circuit parallel to the inside of the stockade and about twenty feet therefrom. It consisted of a narrow strip of board nailed to a row of stakes which were about four feet high. Shoot any prisoner who touches the dead line was the standing order to the guard several companies from Georgia regiments were detailed for the duty and their muskets were loaded with buck and ball, that is, a large bullet and two buckshot. The day guard at the stockade consisted of 186 men, the day reserve of 86 men. The night reserve consisted of 110 men, the outlay pickets of 38 men. A sick prisoner inadvertently placing his hand on the deadline for support, or one who was moon blind running against it, or anyone touching it with suicidal intent, would be instantly shot at, the scattering balls usually striking others than the one aimed at. The intervening space between the wall and the deadline was overgrown with weeds and was occasionally tested by workmen with long drills to ascertain the existence of tunnels. In attempting to escape by this means, the prisoners endeavored to emerge at night some distance from the stockade and take to the woods. To frustrate such attempts, which would inevitably be discovered at roll call the following morning, man-tracking hounds were led by mounted men on a wide circuit around the prison, with the well-nigh universal result that the trail was struck and the fugitive taken. 
later a stockade was erected parallel to the first and some ten or twelve rods beyond tunnels could not be carried so far with the means available they were dug with knives and the dirt was taken out in haversacks or bags drawn in and out by a cord the work of digging was usually carried on at night during the day a sick man lay over the tunnel's mouth in a tent or under a blanket that the roll call sergeant might not discover the fresh earth it was sifted early in the morning from the pocket and down the trouser leg of a comrade who walked unconcernedly about the little grains of earth which he dropped were soon trodden under foot to increase the difficulty of tunnel escape slaves and teams were employed to build piles of pitch pine along the cleared space beyond the outer stockade at night when these were lighted a line of fires was made which illuminated a wide area from these fires arose columns of dense smoke which in the sultry air of a midsummer night hung like a pall over the silent city of disease and starvation yet the city was not wholly quiet for undertones of thousands of voices that murmured during the day at night died away into the low moans of the sick and the expiring or rose into the overtones of the outcry of distressful dreams in the edge of the gloom beyond the fires patrols paced to and fro until the dawn every evening the watch call sounded post number one nine o'clock and all is well this cry was repeated by each sentinel until it had traveled around the stockade back to the place of starting. Nine and a half o'clock, and all is well, was next spoken and likewise repeated. Thus, every half hour from dark to daylight, the time was called off, and this grim challenge greeted our ears every night until the survivors bade the Confederacy goodbye not that our captors benevolently wished to increase the sense of shortness of the time until our release but to be assured that the guards were keeping awake end of chapter two chapter three of prison life in andersonville by john levi miley this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jeffrey Smith, New Orleans, Louisiana. The Prison Commissariat. The least that can be said of the prison sustenance is that it was exceedingly slim. But while the per diem rations dealt out to an Andersonville prisoner were too small for proper maintenance, and much of the time inferior in quality, yet the 32,000 to 35,000 men who had to be fed were, as a rule, promptly served. To secure this result, effective organization was necessary. It was accomplished as follows. Groups of 270 men were named detachments and duly numbered every detachment was divided into the first second and third nineties each of which was in charge of one of our own sergeants the nineties in turn were divided into the first second and third thirties which also were in charge of a sergeant or corporal at ten o'clock every forenoon a drum call was beaten from the platform at the south gate at this signal the prisoners fell into line by detachments forming as best they could in the narrow paths that separated the small tents blanket shanties or dugouts at the same moment a company of confederate sergeants entered the two gates for the purpose of counting and recording the number of the prisoners to each of these officers a certain number of detachments were assigned the men unsheltered from the fierce sun heat 
had perforce to remain standing during the entire count if a number less than that of yesterday was in evidence the federal sergeant had to account for the deficit sometimes a number of men were too ill to stand up so the line was held the longer while the confederate official viewed the sick where they lay the bodies of those who had died since the count of the previous day were early in the morning carried to the south street and laid in a row until the ration wagon could haul them to the burying trench on a card attached to the wrist of the deceased was written by the detachment sergeant his name regiment and date of death these names were taken by the enumerator who verified the record as the bodies were carried through the gate such was the scarcity of clothing that garments of any value were taken by comrades from the dead before interment in the early summer prisoners were occasionally detailed under guard to carry the dead some distance from the gate on the return they were allowed to gather up chips which had accumulated from the hewing of stockade timbers the quantity a man weakened by hunger and disease could bring in would sell for five dollars u s currency competition to get out on one of these details became so intense that the privilege was discontinued at four o'clock in the afternoon rations of cornbread and bacon were issued on the basis of the morning count of those who are able to stand up two army wagons drawn by mules entered the north and south gates simultaneously they were piled high with bread thin loaves of corn bread or johnny cake made of coarse meal and water by our men who had been paroled for that work a blanket was spread upon the ground and the quantity for a detachment was placed thereon in three piles one for every ninety according to the number of men able to eat in like manner the sergeants of nineties subdivided the piles to the thirties the writer had charge of a division of thirty and distributed as follows his blanket was spread in front of his shelter tent and on it he spread the bread in as many pieces as there were men counted in the morning each man had his number and was intently watching the comparative size of the portions sergeant cries one pointing to a cube of bread that piece is smaller than the one next to it a crumb is taken from the one and placed upon the other the relative size of any piece may be challenged by any member of the thirty for his life is involved the equalization is finally completed to the satisfaction of all the sergeant then takes up a piece in his hand and says whose is this a designated comrade looking the other way calls a number the owner steps up and takes his portion this process is repeated until all are served some four or five pounds of bacon are then cut on a board into small pieces and issued in like manner the cube of bread and morsel of meat constitute the ration for twenty-four hours one half may be eaten at once the remainder should be put in the haversack for breakfast if any one yields to his insatiable hunger and eats the whole for supper he has to fast until the following evening and must then deny himself and put away the portion for the next morning's breakfast experiment proved that strength was better sustained by taking the scanty ration of food in two portions than by eating the whole at once when the number of prisoners exceeded fifteen thousand the facilities of the cookhouse were inadequate therefore raw rations were issued alternately every two weeks to each side of the prison 
in this form the amount per capita daily was a scant pint of cornmeal and a scrap of uncooked bacon occasionally boiled rice and cow beans were substituted for the meal but these were very difficult to issue in accurate portions sometimes a quantity of this glutinous food was carried in a sleeve of a shirt or in the trousers leg tied at the end the supply of fuel for cooking was wholly inadequate often the ration of wood was ironically called a toothpick it would be split into small short splinters and two men would sometimes combine their portions water in a quart tin cup setting on small blocks of clay could be brought to a boil before the wood under it was consumed into this water meal was stirred and if the blaze could be yet further economized partially cooked mush was the outcome the sick could not however do this work for themselves many ate meal uncooked but the experiment soon ended life it may be observed that many of the andersonville prisoners were well supplied with money the federal armies were reclothed and paid off in the spring of eighteen sixty four the new recruits and re-enlisted veterans in many instances had with them bounty money when captured greenbacks could be pressed into the sole of a shoe or placed inside a brass button in various ways money was concealed about the person the authorities at andersonville allowed supplies to be sold to the prisoners for federal money numerous small restaurants flourished in the stockade from small clay ovens they supplied fresh bread and baked meats irish and sweet potatoes string beans peas tomatoes melons sweet corn and other garden products were abundantly offered for sale new arrivals were amazed to find these resources in the midst of utter destitution and starvation as this sketch is of the nature of personal experiences the writer might tell how in his case the question of increasing the food supply was solved a ration of fresh beef received by his thirty consisted of a shank bone on which a small amount of lean meat remained this latter was cut into portions about the size of a little finger these were easily issued but what shall be done with the bone which towered on the meat board above the diminutive strips of beef no tools were available by which it could be broken up one and another cried out i don't want the bone for a ration count it out for me i can't gnaw a bone the writer knew that a wealth of nutriment was contained in the rich marrow and oil filled joints and in view of the unanimous rejection of the bone said well boys if none of you want it i will take it as my portion agreed shouted the crowd adding expressions like these come hurry up and call off that meat i'm hungry the strips were speedily issued and for the most part eaten at once the fortunate possessor of what was a large soup bone borrowed from a comrade a kitchen knife with permission to cut on the back of the same teeth which were made with a file procured from a tent mate the steel of the blade was exceedingly hard and by the time the teeth were finished the file was worn nearly smooth however this fact ensured that the teeth would hold their edge the bone was quickly cut in two and the marrow dug out with a splinter what remained was melted out with boiling water and a marrow soup was prepared for six hungry patriots 
next the joints were sawed into slices and the rich oil extracted therefrom with hot water thus for two meals a generous addition was made to our impoverished menu soon after while splitting wood by driving the knife into the end of a stick the blade was snapped off about one and one half inches from the handle this disaster brought consternation for the owner valued his knife at five dollars however a settlement was effected by which the user retained the broken parts and the worn-out file the blade was set into a split stick to be used as a saw as circumstances might require the broken end of the shank was scraped on a brick to form a beveled edge like a chisel later on the fact was demonstrated that these tools were a providential preparation the face of the writer became diseased with the much prevailing scurvy a swollen cheek inflamed and bleeding gums with loosening teeth indicated the fact that a hard fight for life must be put up how shall it be done about this time a stockade was built on three sides of an enclosure attached to the north end of the prison thus making more room for the thousands of additional prisoners who were constantly arriving from many battlefields the intervening wall was taken up and most of the timber sold to the prisoners from one who had purchased a log the writer obtained the wood sufficient to make three water pails working on a two-thirds share this material was delivered to the writer in split strips about three inches thick and four feet long with the knife blade saw these sticks of hard pine were slowly and laboriously cut into lengths for staves which were split on a curve by driving together several sharp pointed wedges into a circular grain of the wood thus each stave was an arc of the circumference of the tree a day's ration was traded for a board three inches wide and thirty inches long a mortise was cut through this to receive the knife chisel which was held in place with a forked wedge after the manner of a carpenter's plane this was the jointer on which the edges of the staves were smoothed and its upper end was placed on the knee of the writer who sat tailor fashion on the ground and the lower end was placed in a hole in the earth the pieces for the bottom of the pail were split flat across the circular grain of the tree and the edges were also smoothed on the jointer for the want of truss hoops the problem of setting up the staves seemed insurmountable a sleepless night was passed in thinking the matter through at four o'clock in the morning the inspiration came and the solution was dig a hole in the ground the form and slope of the perspective pail this was speedily done and the staves were successfully set half their length in this mold and the last one driven home brought the hole into shape two knapsack straps were passed around the top of the pail and held it together it was then carefully drawn out of the hole and hoops made of split saplings were put in place and the handle of like material was made precious food was bartered for these split stems and the resultant fasting added to the prevailing starvation nearly cost the writer his life pieces for the bottom were jointed placed on the ground and on them the pail was set a pencil was run round on this bottom and the end of each piece was cut with saw and chisel wherever the curved mark indicated days of incessant labor with chisel and a borrowed jackknife sufficed to produce from hard pitch pine 
the staves for the sides and bottom of a water pail of the ordinary size when at last the pail was completed so imperfect were the joints that meal could be sifted through derisive laughter greeted the apparent failure of a pail to hold water through the joints of which the light freely shone however the maker depended on the dry wood of the staves swelling tight if only the hoops proved strong enough to stand the immense pressure happily this resulted and in triumph the first made pail was handed over to the owner of the log in payment for the wood from which three pails could be made the second pail was more speedily made and sold for a dollar fifty with which the proprietor bought vegetables which eaten raw cured the scurvy in his face during the following winter which was passed in the confederate prison at florence south carolina the shoes worn by the most of our group owing to defective machine stitching peeled from the toe to the heel causing almost constantly damp feet to the serious detriment of health again the writer was obliged to make a fight for life recalling the process of making his chisel he scraped on a brick the shank of his worn-out file into a point like a pegging awl a gum tree knot served as a handle a two-inch nut from a car bolt was screwed to a handle for a shoe hammer a piece of soft pine was whittled into a last with the knife saw maple chips were cut into right lengths for shoe pegs which were shaped one by one with this equipment the loosened soles were tightly pegged to the uppers the shoes thus made water tight contributed no little to our chances of survival the writer afterwards mended shoes for one of the wood chopping party who secured of field negroes sweet potatoes which he brought with the working squad into the prison at evening and with them paid for the mending these were cooked by the writer and retailed to the prisoners with a large profit in u s fractional currency confederate money was secretly purchased forty dollars for one and with this supplies could be lawfully bought of the prison sutler bread per small loaf flour per pound and a fair-sized cabbage could be bought each for ten dollars we drove a flourishing trade in hot cabbage soup with men who possessed any money especially to those who without shelter literally piled themselves together for mutual warmth during the piercing cold and rain of a southern winter night the soup was made in the following manner a cabbage consisted of a stalk with a tuft of leaves on the upper end and a bunch of roots on the lower end the whole was washed clean and chopped up fine with a knife chisel the sliced leaves stem and roots were boiled in eight quarts of water until made as tender as heat could do it into the green colored liquid was stirred some flour thickening the whole was salted and a minced red pepper was added for pungency while a whole pepper floated on the surface as an advertisement for a soup dipper a piece of pale hoop was riveted to the side of a condensed milk can the two rivets being cut from a copper scent with the chisel driven with the shoe hammer for soup plates a canteen was melted apart and the two halves formed each a plate on market square down by the swamp four slender stakes were driven and thereon was placed a pine shake which formed the soup counter footnote market square was a piece of made ground on the edge of the swamp in the center of the prison here men came together to barter trinkets they had made 
to while away the time, to exchange parts of rations, and to indulge generally, so far as they could, in the Yankee instinct for trade. End footnote. The soup kettle was covered with a piece of woolen shirt which kept in the heat. Very early each morning we opened up for business and a line of shivering men in rags and nearly perished from exposure formed as the soup brigade. The price per plate was a five-cent shin plaster of U.S. fractional currency. The poor fellow who had no money must needs go without. As new prisoners ceased to arrive, the money supply was soon gathered up and the prison sutler went away and trade was brought to an end. Our last plate of soup was sold to a Maine soldier who paid for it his last five cents. He was nearly naked and incessantly shivered from the cold. The writer found him the following morning after a night of rain to which he was exposed with his knees drawn up to his chin in the instinctive effort to bring the surfaces of his body together for warmth with difficulty his frame was straightened out for burial the profit of this business for several weeks gave to our group of six one fairly good meal each day and made possible the survival of those of our number who finally emerged from this awful prison life. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 of Prison Life in Andersonville by John Levi Miley This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jeffrey Smith, New Orleans, Louisiana. A Dearth of Water If the food supply of Andersonville was bad, the water supply was worse. To understand the situation and to see how little was done to overcome the difficulties involved, and to make the most of the existing facilities for the relief of the suffering, one has to consider the formation of this prison encampment. The surface of the interior consisted of two hillsides sloping respectively north and south towards the center, which was occupied by a swamp of nearly four acres. This was traversed by a sluggish creek which was some five feet wide and six inches deep and made its way along the foot of the south slope. Up the stream were located the headquarters of Captain Wirtz, the camps of the Confederate artillery and infantry, and the cookhouse for the prisoners. The drainage of these localities entered the creek which flowed into the prison through spaces between the stockade timbers, and polluted the water which was the chief supply of the prison, and which, at midnight, in its clearest condition, was the color of amber. The intervening space at the foot of the north hill was a wide morass and, when overflowed by rains, became a vast cesspool on which boundless swarms of flies settled down and laid their eggs, which were speedily hatched by the fervent heat of the nearly tropical sun and became a horrible undulating mass. On a change of wind, the odor could be detected miles away. Indeed, it was reported that the people of Macon petitioned General Howell Cobb, the military governor of Georgia, for a removal of the prison located 60 miles away, lest an awful pestilence sweep over their country. The turkey buzzards, birds of ill omen, would come up against the wind, alight on the bare limbs of the tall pines overlooking the prison, and circle over the grizzled city as if waiting to descend for a carrion feast. When we entered the prison on May 23rd, our detachment of 270 men was scheduled 55, 
indicating the presence of 14,850 prisoners. The number steadily rose until a reported 35,000 were present at one time. As the arrivals increased by hundreds and thousands, the daily mortality was counted by scores and hundreds, and many of the sick were without shelter from the heat of the pitiless sun. As the killed and wounded are scattered over the fields of the sanguinary battle, so our dying sick lay around on every hand. In the early summer, Captain Wirtz issued to the prisoners picks and shovels with which to dig wells for increased water supply. From some of these wells the men started tunnels through which to escape. Discovering this, the commander withdrew the tools and ordered the wells to be filled up. Permission to keep one of them open was purchased by a group of prisoners. It was sunk to a necessary depth, covered with a platform and trap door, and supplied about 1,000 men. Aside from this well, for the favored few, the only water supply was from about 12 feet of the length of the creek, which reached between the dead line and the bridge connecting the two divisions of the prison. A terrible water famine set in, with the result that many of the ailing ones became insane from thirst. In these unsanitary surroundings, there is a well-authenticated case of a man who was severely afflicted with scurvy. As he lay in the place of filth and stench, without medical attention, until gangrene of the lower limbs set in, he realized that to save his life he must lose his feet. No one of his comrades had the nerve to perform the necessary operation, so he obtained an old knife and disjointed his pedal extremities. In November 1863, an order was issued for the establishment of a prison in Georgia, the granary of the eastern part of the Confederacy, and for this purpose a tract of land was selected near the town of Andersonville. A stockade fifteen feet high, enclosing sixteen and a half acres, was built, and this, in June 1864, was enlarged to twenty-six and a half acres, but three and a quarter acres near the center were too marshy to be used. A small stream ran through the enclosure, which, it was thought, would furnish water sufficient for drinking and for bathing. The trees within the stockade were cut down, and no shelter was provided for the expected inmates, who began to arrive in February 1864, before the rude prison was completed according to the design, and before an adequate supply of bacon for their use had been received. Prisoners continued to come until, on the 5th of May, there were about 12,000, which number went on increasing until, in August, it exceeded 32,000. Their condition was one of extreme wretchedness. Those who came first erected rude shelters from the debris of the stockade. Later arrivals burrowed in the ground or protected themselves with any blankets or pieces of cloth of which they had not been deprived according to the practice of robbing men who were taken prisoners, which prevailed on both sides. Through an unfortunate location of the baking and cooking houses on the creek above the stockade, the water became polluted before it reached the prisoners, so that to obtain pure water they must dig wells. After a severe storm, a spring broke out within the enclosure, and this became one of the main reliances for drinking water. The sinks were constructed over the lower part of the stream, but the current was not swift enough to carry away the orger, and when the stream was swollen by rain and overflowed, the fecal matter was deposited over a wide area, 
producing a horrible stench. This was the famous prison of Andersonville. From Rhodes' History of the United States, Volume 5, pages 483 to 515. The history of Andersonville prison pen has shocked the world with its tales of horror, of woe, and of death, before unheard of and unknown to civilization. No pen can describe, no artist can paint, no imagination comprehend their fearful and unutterable sufferings. Into the narrow confines of this prison were herded more than 35,000 enlisted men whose only fault was they wore the Union blue, many of them the bravest and best, the most devoted and heroic of those grand armies that carried the flag of the Union to final victory. For long and weary months they suffered and died for that flag, here they suffered unsheltered from the burning rays of a southern sun, or were drenched by the rain and deadly dews of the night. All this while they were in every stage of physical disease, hungered, emaciated, starving. Is it a wonder that during the month of August, 1864, one man died in every eleven minutes? night and day or that for six months beginning april eighteen sixty four one died every twenty-two and one-half minutes night and day this should forever silence the assertion that men would be taken prisoners rather than risk their lives on the firing line the lack of water was the cause of much disease and suffering under the most favorable circumstances the water supply was insufficient for one quarter of the number of men confined there all the water obtainable was from a sluggish creek that ran through the grounds and in addition to this there were thirty six hundred men acting as guards camped on the bank of this stream before it reached the prison pen and the water became so foul no words can describe it from a sketch of andersonville by miss elizabeth a turner chairman andersonville prison board journal of the twenty fifth national convention of the women's relief corps page one sixty nine more things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of Tennyson. End of chapter four. Chapter five of Prison Life in Andersonville by John Levi Miley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jeffrey Smith, New Orleans, Louisiana. A Cry to Heaven the bitter cry which arose from the suffering camp was changed on the lips of a few to an appeal to heaven where else could men look in their dire extremity one evening early in august the sound of the old long meter doxology was heard from the voices of a group of men gathered around the solitary pine stump in the enclosure which was situated at the end of the north street of the prison where space was left for the ration wagon to turn around on this stump was seated an emaciated cavalry sergeant mr shepherd of columbus ohio formerly an honored preacher of the gospel in days past he had frequently been called upon to offer prayer over the remains of some deceased comrade and now he led in the old and well-known hymn to call like-minded souls together some twenty-five unkempt starving men gathered around him and joined in the familiar strain what memories of family worship and old-time services in the meeting-house those words called up said brother shepherd in substance 
I have today read in the book of Numbers of Moses, striking the rock from which water gushed out for the ample supply of man and beast. I tell you, God must strike a rock in Andersonville, or we shall all die of thirst. And if there is no rock here, he can smite the ground and bring forth water to supply our desperate needs. Of this I am sure. Let us ask him to do this. Pointing to an uncombed, unwashed, ragged comrade standing close by, he said, Will the brother from Chicago pray? He then successively called on other acquaintances, distinguishing them by their different localities at home. All the prayers were poured out in the one desire for water. For perhaps an hour the meeting continued and closed with the doxology. The words of the leader were, Boys, when you awake during the night, offer to God a little prayer for water. Do the same many times tomorrow, and let us meet here in the evening to pray again for water. If memory be not at fault, these individual and collective petitions were steadfastly offered from Monday evening to Thursday evening. For a month previous, we had noticed that a number of the stockade timbers near the north gate had been loosened by the percolating of the copious rain, and that they were sagging considerably and had settled out of line. We wondered why they had been allowed to remain so long in this unsafe condition. Was it a coincidence that after prayer began to be offered, the quartermaster of the prison notified Captain Wirtz that stockade timbers were out of line and should be set right? He was ordered to take a gang of slaves and make the necessary repairs. About fifteen stalwart negroes were marched through the main gate and turned into the twenty-foot space between the deadline and the wall. With pike poles, the closely adjoining posts were heaved into position, and the earth was closely tamped. Then the workers faced about and commenced digging a trench up the hill nearly as wide as the space between the deadline and the stockade. A part of the gang swung their picks into the red clay, which was shoveled against the timbers. Another set followed with heavy rammers and pounded the hole into a smooth sloping surface which was tamped closely to the base of the wooden wall, making a perfect watershed and thus preventing the further loosening of the earth at the base of the stockade. By Thursday evening the broad trench with rounded bottom was completed from the swamp up the deadline space to the north gate. THE WOMAN'S RELIEF CORPS Today beneath our nation's flag, the old red, white, and blue, a band of noble women work with a purpose just and true, to aid and succor those who fought to save our honored land, for home and freedom, God and right, those earnest women stand. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 of Prison Life in Andersonville by John Levi Miley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jeffrey Smith, New Orleans, Louisiana. Unsealing of the Spring. On Friday morning, an ominous stillness pervaded nature. By the middle of the forenoon, a dense, dark cloud was noticed in the southwest quarter of the horizon, slowly creeping upward. It rose above the treetops, majestic and awful in appearance. A troop of small, scurrying, angry-looking clouds seemed to form an advancing line to the vast mass of storm cloud. The onward movement quickened, 
and soon the front of the mountain of approaching cloud assumed a gray appearance caused by the mighty downpour of water which more nearly than anything else seemed a continuous cloudburst crashes of thunder broke over our heads and flashes of lightning swished around us as if the air was filled with short circuits the awful moving wall came towards us rapidly and we understood what was happening as the mighty deluge swept through the clearing west of the prison we bowed our heads in preparation of submersion in the advancing water spout when it came upon us the sensation was as if a million buckets of water were being poured upon us at once the air was so filled with the roaring hissing flood that we could not look up but bent forward to protect our faces covering our nostrils with our hands to preserve a little breathing space instantly rivulets of water poured down over our bodies as if a hose were discharging its stream on our shoulders and the surface of the filthy ground was soon covered with a rush of muddy water the swamp space as quickly filled with great swirling eddies the upper stockade served as a dam across the creek which in a few minutes became swollen into the dimensions of a river driftwood bore down upon the stockade causing it to give way with a mighty crash the heavy timbers were whirled across the prison as if they were mere straws and by the force of their impact carried away the rear stockade from the batteries solid shot was fired over our heads to warn us that if we attempted to escape through the opening in the wall we would be swept by the cannon the roar of the guns chimed harmoniously with the thundering of the storm in the awful suspense of such overwhelming conditions the progress of time could not be measured the downpour may have continued twenty minutes perhaps half an hour or possibly longer so great was its fury that we felt it must soon end or it would end us fortunately it ceased as suddenly as it came looking up we saw the great water wall retreating the sun burst forth with unwonted vigor and shone with brilliant effect upon the receding rain a dense fog arose from the drying garments of thirty-five thousand human bodies and from the exhalations of surrounding surfaces as the heavy mist cleared away the drenched and forlorn prisoners tried to be merry they viewed with complacency the breach in the walls of the infamous pen and wished that every timber had been leveled to the earth a witty comrade on the south hill of the prison thinking to convey desired information to the north side shouted at the top of his voice water water men on the north side as by a common impulse answered back and the two great companies in turn shouted the magic word much as the opposite hosts on ibal and jerazim alternately responded amen immediately after this antiphonal outburst a voice was heard from the north gate ringing out in clear tones the thrilling words a spring a spring a spring is broken out where where was the eager inquiry which arose at once from many lips the rider tried to press his way toward the north gate but the crowd was so dense that no progress could be made the excitement of the moment was indescribable during a lull someone sang out you fellows over by the north gate tell us has a spring broken out yes was the reply an emphatic yes then was further shouted the explanation where the trench was dug the flood has torn up the earth and a spring has gushed out as soon as opportunity afforded we pressed our way to the spot and there just below the north gate 
in the center of the space between the stockade and the deadline at the point where the earth had been most deeply excavated the sloping surfaces had gathered the waters of the flood the bottom of the trench was torn up some twenty inches uncovering the vent of a spring of purest crystal water which shot up into the air in a column and falling in a fan-like spray went babbling down the grade into the noxious brook looking across the dead line we beheld with wondering eyes and grateful hearts the fountain spring but our relief was not yet realized the question which now concerned us was how to bring its cooling waters within reach of our lips in the afternoon and evening of that eventful friday we prayed that god would so turn the heart of captain wirtz that he would allow the precious water to be conveyed within our lines we waited in suspense for the answer and on saturday morning to our delight we saw the quartermaster again enter the gate with a gang of slaves bringing fence boards hammers nails axes and stakes a double row of the latter was driven so that the direction crossed the dead line at a slight angle down the hill a strip was nailed across each pair of stakes and in the aperture rested a trough made of two fence boards nailed together at the lower end of this chute in an excavation was set a sugar hogshead around which clay was tamped so as to aid in making it water tight when all was ready the upper end of the chute was thrust under the falling column of water which swiftly ran down and filled to overflowing the large barrel from this the men by crowds dipped freely of the refreshing life-giving water laughter songs and thanksgiving abounded thus was wrought before our eyes a gracious work of providence which to many of us was quite as wonderful and quite as manifestly the work of the all-father as was the smitten rock in the palestine desert from which the thirst of the fainting hosts of israel was slacked in their desert wanderings End of chapter 6chapter seven of prison life in andersonville by john levi miley this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by jeffrey smith new orleans louisiana was it a miracle a profound conviction has been cherished by many that the unsealing of provident spring was as marked an interposition of the hand of the almighty as that recorded in the book of numbers where it is said and moses lifted up his hand and smote the rock with his rod twice and water came forth abundantly and the congregation drank numbers chapter twenty verse eleven are they wrong in this conviction the unwontedness of the incident admits of no dispute in such a sober work as rhodes history of the united states we have the statement after a severe storm a spring broke out within the enclosure andersonville stockade and this became one of the main reliances for drinking water volume five page four ninety two an eyewitness records about the first of august showers fell that beat anything i ever saw there was one good result for where the stockade was washed away on the north side it opened a spring of pure water enough to supply nearly the whole of the prison the narrative of amos e stearns company a twenty-fifth regiment massachusetts published by franklin pierce eighteen eighty seven while comparatively few of the prisoners knew of the days of prayer that preceded the storm 
every one recognized that something out of the ordinary course of events had happened and that a new spirit pervaded the camp before this no one would give a dying man a drink for water was scarce and the scurvy in the recipient's mouth might contaminate the cup for its owner and indeed not many had the strength to wait upon others but now the dull somber despairing mood was changed the little stream of pure water contrasted with the former slough that supplied us murmured sweetly down through the night and during the day it overbrimmed thousands of cups that eager hands reached forth in after days many of these men were gathered at camp chase ohio and there detained until improved health rendered them presentable for return home we recall that when in the chapel of that place a captain allen conducted evening religious services hundreds of testimonies were given to the effect that the breaking out of the spring at andersonville was a distinct answer to prayer and a convincing fact of the reality of help coming from above many of the speakers declared that their christian faith began from that occurrence questions such as the following naturally arise was providence spring a miracle would the saving relief have been withheld if prayer had not been offered the situation is not more difficult of analysis than is that described in the story of queen esther where is exhibited the interplay of natural and supernatural elements in human activity and divine overruling the northern section of the andersonville enclosure was mainly a bank of clay as evidenced by the many wells which were partially sunk but filled by order of captain wirtz because tunnels therefrom were dug for escape the vein of water which issued in providence spring doubtless flowed from time immemorial and being unable to work upward through a too great overpress of clay had found a lower seam through which it seeped into the depths of the swamp below this implied fact was learned as follows as the prison administration was unable to cook meal and bacon for the increasing thousands of men these articles were issued raw for two weeks alternately to the north and south sides of the enclosure a distressingly small lot of wood must suffice a detachment of two hundred and seventy men for three days often the individual portion would not make a fire that would scald much less cook the scant portion of cornmeal which was sometimes coarse and unbolted it was said that more than ten thousand cases of bloody dysentery prevailed at one time aggravated by irritation to stomach and intestines from the practically uncooked food the awful unsanitary conditions which prevailed can be described but respect for the sensibilities of the reader forbids suffice it to say that the need for fuel was urgent that a number of the stronger captives would lay aside their tattered remnants of clothing wade into the slimy muck of the swamp and sinking to their armpits would pull up fragments of wood that had long been submerged this was mostly pitch pine and when broken up would quickly burn the work of exhuming fuel under such repulsive conditions was chiefly done at night it was noticed that in the morning the partially remaining footprints and depression from which the stick had been drawn were filled with clear water this fact was a mystery until after the spring was opened then the conclusion was reached that the spring water followed a deep seam in the clay 
and oozed into the swamp some distance below the surface and rose up through the openings made by the wood diggers therefore providence spring was not especially created to order like topsy it had always been the providential aspects of the case may be thus stated the spring existed but was unknown it was located under the space between the deadline and the stockade through which digging for a well was not permitted it therefore remained undiscovered the out of plumb position of the stockade timbers had existed for a long time but was not noticed by the officials until the time when prayer began to be offered for water as the petitions of esther and mordecai unknown to the king in a manner unseen affected his action so by analogy the prayer of sergeant shepherd and his colleagues influenced the state of mind of the quartermaster and of commandant wirtz and they were moved to the repairing of the stockade which had long been neglected this decision led to the forming of a broad trench by digging away the ground to afford the needed watershed from the base of the stockade thus a channel was formed which gathered the storm water with force sufficient to tear away the ground over the spring and release the life-giving fountain the slaves removed quite a depth of the earth directly over the unknown reservoir thus the deepest part of the trench was brought so near the spring that the rush of the storm flow could do the rest the spring water was uncovered and its pressure was sufficient to throw it into the air however as it was located on the forbidden margin any prisoner reaching under or over the deadline for a draught of the water would be instantly shot by the sentinel posted overhead on the wall hence after the spring was opened an object of much desire and suitable as a subject of prayer was that the hardness of captain wirtz would be relaxed to the extent of allowing the prisoners to have access to the water this result was accomplished and the relief was complete a recent writer commenting on the development of providence spring refers to the marble fountain erected by the ex-prisoners of war association inside the granite pavilion built over the spring by the women's relief corps remarks the waters flow strong and sweet with a never-ceasing stream into the marble basin it is said to be the best water in all georgia that which gushes forth from the side of the little hill in andersonville confirmatory to this statement is the following incident in eighteen ninety six when the writer lectured in warsaw new york on reminiscences of battlefields and prisons a prominent war veteran of the town who had been a member of the staff of general grant showed him a bottle of water from providence spring which nine years before had been hermetically sealed by the rev g stanley lathrop of atlanta so pure was the content that no sediment existed the further comment is the scientific fact of providence spring is that in the august electrical storm the rocks clay which held back this spring were cracked or broken open by a lightning bolt and the waters gushed forth no one ever believed that it was a sort of moses intervention for the prisoners but it was undoubtedly looked upon in that light by the poor thirsty half-starved prisoners to which we reply that 
if we believe in prayer as an instrumentality by which human and divine forces cooperate to a beneficent end and the result takes place why should we question the efficacy of intercession the fact that a number of believing men in the prison were engaged for some days in protracted prayer for relief from water famine was not ostentatiously announced at the time and was little noticed by the crowd thus has it ever been with the origin of great spiritual movements the relief came and a new spirit of hope and gladness such as prevailing prayer engenders swept through the multitude the scientific fact of a mighty rainstorm being the visible agency of completing the opening of providence spring fitly coordinates with the moral force of prayer as in numberless instances such convergence occurs in history nevertheless this explanation will probably be accepted or challenged according to the personal experience of the reader in matters of christian faith in the case of the smitten rock of the palestine desert water doubtless existed in an abundant although unknown supply the almighty by the agency of moses brought it forth for the satisfying of a great multitude the prophet was commanded to speak to the rock and it would give forth water the response could be from none other than the creator of all mountains and flowing streams and although moses went beyond the divine command and struck with a rod instead of speaking with his voice yet the divine goodness was not withheld and the water came abundantly so at andersonville the sufficient though unknown supply was close at hand human voices pleading for relief were answered by him who spoke by the wind the lightning and the flood it is said that the spiritual desires of our hearts are the reflection of what god is waiting to do for us through our own cooperation surely then the prayers of the andersonville prisoners for water were incited by him who saw their dire necessity and who waited only for human hands to aid in the release of the fountain of water which his omnipotence had created during the subsequent years the writer has given the foregoing account in lectures and conversations to his comrades of the great army of the republic and to many others gentlemen of scientific and christian attainments have said that this explanation of the phenomenon of providence spring is the most satisfactory of any that they have heard the event here chronicled is commemorated by the erection on the spot of a granite pavilion which is appropriately named providence spring the inscriptions are as follows this fountain erected by the national association of union ex prisoners of war in memory of the fifty two thousand three hundred forty five comrades who were confined here as prisoners of war and of the thirteen thousand nine hundred comrades buried in the adjoining national cemetery dedicated memorial day may thirteenth nineteen hundred and one james atwell national commander s m long adjutant general j d walker c h a m period e x period committee a reverse tablet bears the words this pavilion was erected by the women's relief corps auxiliary to the grand army of the republic in grateful memory of the men who suffered and died in the confederate prison at andersonville georgia 
from February 1864 to April 1865. The prisoner's cry of thirst rang up to heaven. God heard, and with his thunder cleft the earth and poured his sweetest waters gushing here. Erected 1901 End of chapter 7chapter eight of prison life in andersonville by john levi miley this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by jeffrey smith new orleans louisiana deliverance footnote on february twentieth nineteen twelve the writer received a call from an old friend rev m l holt of nulli nebraska he gives this confirmatory statement to mr miley as sergeant major of the third new hampshire veteran volunteer infantry i can certify to the military surroundings at the place of your release two days before your arrival from goldsboro general terry ordered our third new hampshire to make a forced march to a point ten miles distant from wilmington on the northeast branch of the cape fear river and take from the enemy a pontoon bridge at that point we skirmished with the foe nearly the entire distance and came up to them just as they had cut the near end of the bridge from the bank with our machine guns we drove them off and moored the bridge back to its place on the second day after we received the old andersonville prisoners and had the satisfaction of knowing we had prepared their way by having the bridge in readiness for them to cross the river into our lines i shall never forget the impression made upon us by the condition of these survivors of confederate prisons these events occurred in march eighteen sixty one end of footnote at a point on the cape fear river about ten miles from wilmington north carolina a train load of old andersonville prisoners who had been confined also at florence south carolina and salisbury north carolina were delivered to general terry they had just been paroled at goldsboro and were received by him about the middle of march eighteen sixty five his headquarters was at a point on the cape fear river and recently taken from the enemy it was now held by the third new hampshire sixteenth new york heavy artillery and by a division of colored troops the freight cars halted in a pine forest about a mile from this position which commanded a pontoon bridge a squad of cavalry received the ex-prisoners unfurling the stars and stripes in greeting many of the boys in blue wept when they saw our plight the released men tried to hurrah but were too weak to raise much of a shout three ambulances were loaded with as many of the sick as could be taken on the first trip at the farther end of the pontoon bridge the road led through a deep cut in the bank up to the open space of the camp where guns pointed over the river towards the forest through which the freight train had come from goldsboro with the paroled men spanning this cut was an arch constructed of evergreen boughs and faced with the white cloth square of shelter tent upon which was spelled in letters made of evergreen sprigs the sixteenth new york welcomes you home the march of a mile from the railroad to the pontoon bridge greatly exhausted the paroled prisoners 
at first the excitement of once more gazing upon the flag they loved and being received by the advance squadron stimulated them to walk with some show of vigor but soon their eyes shone with the unwanted brightness of fatigue in contrast with their pinched and grimy faces many sank by the wayside to be picked up by the ambulance when the same could return for them the stronger ones worked up into the head of the column which crossed the pontoon bridge and the advance files of men undertook to walk up through the cut in the bank at the bridge end but their feet sank in the sand and they were too weak to go further meanwhile a company of colored soldiers were drawn up through the cut in two ranks facing between these lines and under the arch our ambulance passed the horses tugging with might and mane up the steep grade and through the deep sand the white officers and the black soldiers stood at present arms the eyes of the soldiers opened and their teeth gleamed with an aspect of astonishment as they for the first time beheld seasoned graduates from a course of experiences in war prisons the living wrecks in the ambulances were still more pale and ghastly than were the stronger ones following slowly on foot and as the latter emerged from the woods on to the floating bridge the onlooking crowd of our men off duty began to be stirred with a great excitement as the ambulances lined up before headquarters general terry approached with him were the brigade surgeon and a representative of the united states christian commission the general looked upon us with tear-dimmed eyes and turning to the surgeon gave his pocket flask saying doctor for god's sake help these poor fellows this ambulance stopped on the crest of the hill when the christian commission man stepped to its side and said to the rider my boy you will get out here seeing i was too weak to rise from the seat he said just lie across my shoulder this i did and he carried me into a nearby country church building which sheltered the sick until they could be conveyed by boat to wilmington meanwhile the straggling column of paroled prisoners had crossed the bridge an officer undertook to form them into ranks so as to march in form under the arch and between the lines which stood at present arms their feet sank in the soft sand of the cut and after taking a few steps they were utterly exhausted the officer in charge thus addressed the two lines shoulder arms order arms stack arms break ranks and carry these men up the hill with a mighty cheer the athletic colored soldiers sprang forward and each picked up an emaciated wilted prisoner carried him up the hill and tenderly placed him on the ground in due time the sick were taken by boat to the right house hospital wilmington and the stronger ones were placed in a camp waiting transportation by steamer to the north in the winter of 1875-76 the partially regained health of the writer collapsed and he was advised to consult his former regimental surgeon dr wells b fox the doctor said you may live a good while and you may not prepare to leave your family in as good shape as possible if you have unsettled accounts fix them up pursuant to this advice and needing the benefit of a climate warmer than a michigan winter he went to washington to close up some army matters 
here he was received very kindly by surgeon general barnes and by him ordered to have a thorough examination by experts of the medical department the diagnosis was more favorable than was deemed possible and its correctness has been verified by the subsequent years on the journey from sheboygan to washington a stop was made at greenville with his host a call was made on the rev james l patton pastor of the congregational church of that place as the evening passed conversation turned to army happenings after reciting some experiences in the service of the united states christian commission with an aroused manner dr patton said i must tell you of an occasion that i shall never forget i was in the christian commission service outside wilmington north carolina near the close of the war with general terry when he received the first installment of old andersonville prisoners as they were sent into our lines terry was all broken up over their condition could the prisoners walk asked the rider yes he replied some of them could but many had to be brought in on ambulances he was asked where did you put those who were sick we laid them on the floor of a little church that was close by dr patton replied extending his hand the rider said dr patton thank you why why he replied hesitatingly you need not thank me for the story it is true and you are welcome to it yes was the response i have no doubt the story is true i do not thank you for it but for helping me out of the ambulance at that time need it be said that these two men found themselves comrades indeed End of chapter 8、chapter 9 of Prison Life in Andersonville by John Levi Miley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jeffrey Smith, New Orleans, Louisiana. An incident by the way. A steamboat on the northeast branch of the Cape Fear River carried our paroled men from the station held by General Terry to the city of Wilmington. One of the principal mansions was owned by a Dr. Wright, who had fled with his family on the approach of the Union troops. His fine residence was converted into a hospital for the arrivals who were sick during the ride from goldsboro on top of a freight car the rider was taken ill and was barely able to walk the steamer plank at the point of transfer after resting in the little country church he was taken to the wright house hospital and assigned a straw bed on the floor of a room in the third story soldier nurses proceeded to take off his infested prison rags and to give him a sponge rub he fainted under the process and had a run of fever during which he was delirious when the point of death was apparently reached his vitality took a turn for the better and he rapidly improved on the floor of his room were twelve narrow straw beds having a succession of occupants who with a few exceptions were soon transferred to their final resting places many of the ex-prisoners having died from the effects of the too early use of solid food the physicians became extremely cautious and limited the sick to small quantities of the most simple preparations during the writer's convalescence his ravenous hunger was unsatisfied by the slender allowance it happened that his bed ended up to a window and his favorite occupation was to sit on his pillow and watch the proceedings in the yard below 
here was a servant's cottage occupied by two colored women who evidently had excused themselves from flight with their master the older one moved about with quiet dignity and doubtless had been the mamma of the family with evident pleasure she watched the new life and movement around her and held in restraint her young and vivacious companion in the yard soldier cooks prepared in large kettles great quantities of beef soup which was ladled into pails carried to the kitchen and served to the patients throughout the building a young artilleryman from olean new york lay on a straw pallet alongside that of the writer the one was called olean and the other michigan from his post of observation at the window the latter one morning watched the handling of the soup below with an interest that could not be concealed say michigan what are you looking at inquired olean i am looking at them pouring out the soup was the reply and say olean i wish i could have a good smell of it smell of the soup said olean contemptuously if i was a wishing i'd wish i had some and not just a smell upon this sagacious remark a number of the occupants of the other beds passed the wink or laugh with a feeble hacking sound their pinched faces brightening with a sense of mirth the practical wisdom of the suggestion was not lost upon michigan who said if i was a little stronger i would take my cup go down the stairs and into the yard and i would say boys i'm awfully hungry please give me some soup ah 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 laughed olean say michigan i'll bet you five cents you can't walk the length of your bed and touch the doorknob upon this challenge the other patients from their pillows exchanged glances several braced up on the elbow and discussed the possibility of one of their number leaving his room without permission to forage for refreshments the consensus of opinion was that he could not succeed who are you talking to vigorously responded michigan you think i can't do it i'll show you what i can do grasping the projecting window moulding he helped himself to his feet carefully balancing his trembling steps along the narrow space between the beds on the floor and triumphantly grasping the knob of the door exclaimed there now olean i've done it i've done it where's your five cents oh i haven't any five cents replied olean but say michigan you would look mighty fine going down those stairs wouldn't you thereupon the observing comrades laughed in great glee and weakness like little children a very trifling incident amused them they nodded their heads at each other and exchanged approving glances our regulation costume was a gray army shirt drawers of like material and a pair of socks thus appareled michigan opened the door into the hall peered over the railing down the two flights of stairs and seeing the coast clear worked along to the newel post and carefully lowered himself one or two steps thinking discretion might be the better part of valor he tested his strength for the return by trying to retrace the steps down which he had come he was quite unable to lift himself on the rising so must needs continue down the two flights resting his weight on the rail dizzy and breathless he stood by the stair post on the main floor at this juncture the hospital steward suddenly entered and was amazed to find a very weak patient in a state of migration what are you doing here he hurriedly and angrily asked what room do you belong to and who said you might leave it oh i'm just taking a little exercise was the reply the steward rang for an attendant and with an oath said 
no more of this i will order a man to help you to your room and there you stay but no helper appeared so our hero summoned all his determination and walked through the hall to the back porch here a stack of plain coffins greeted his view and he fancied that one of them belonged to him going down the veranda steps he held to the rail and coming into the full rays of the sun turned faint and for a few minutes was helpless again he summoned all the powers of his will and started down the gravel walk towards the servant's cottage reaching the porch of the same he sank exhausted on the steps with head resting against the corner post just then the old mamma came out of her room and caught sight of the wasted form and pale face of the would-be soup hunter gazing pityingly upon his emaciation and speaking to her assistant she exclaimed dinah dinah come ya come ya look at dat ar po white child he bleached so white as linen then addressing him she said where ya come from where ya come from oh auntie he gasped i came out of the hospital to get some soup and i can't get any further auntie give me something to eat i'm awfully hungry dinah dinah she said go to the cupboard and get a big slice of the cone pone just slip it under your apron and bring it yeah to me passing the generous slice under her own apron the old mammy stood by the veranda post looking the meanwhile intently at a distant object as if oblivious to all near concerns thus she partially screened the invalid from observation and reaching the portion down to his hand tenderly said dar now honey you eat that bread no second invitation to indulge his famished appetite was needed the slice of cone pone speedily disappeared strange to say no inconvenience resulted the food aroused the dormant vitality and the young fellow eagerly exclaimed auntie auntie that was so good give me some more no honey she said decisively de doctor see me do dis ya yeah. i dun go swa then the invalid began to cry hysterically the sympathy of the kind old heart was still further aroused and spreading her great hand on his head she said softly po child po child he want to see he mutter mother mother how that word stirred his heart and aroused his memory so weakened by suffering physical vigor from the dark hand upon his head was surcharged with vitality that probably stimulated the depleted personality again the young man asked auntie auntie give me some more and again came the reply no honey de doctor see me do this he send me off for sure meanwhile olean was pressing his face against the third-story window to see how michigan was prospering in his quest for soup a soldier nurse approached the cottage and auntie who seemed to be on good terms with all interceded for her guest dis ya child done come down for 